Well, um, can everyone hear me? Even people sitting in the back? Okay, good. Um, yeah, so um, um, maybe we should actually try to see if we can turn off the, the lights over there. Is there a button for that? Don't want to press all these random buttons over here. So turn off all the lights. Ah, yeah, perfect. Thanks. So, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for showing up. I mean, it's the first uh, first talk of the day, so I think most of, uh, of the people would probably have a hangover and <coughs> have a hard time getting out of bed and showing up. But um, yeah, I'm here to talk about uh, Cloud ABI, um, a project I've been working on for the last half a year, and um, it's it's actually the well, I I spoke about Cloud ABI at another conference uh, last month, but this is the uh, I mean, the second time I have sort of an international crowd sitting here, so uh, I really uh, wonder what you guys think of it, and you know, feedback is welcome. So let me, uh, uh, before I'm going to explain what Cloud ABI is and what it does, let me sort of give a small background, who am I? So I've been, when I was making this slide, I discovered that I've been sort of using FreeBSD and hacking on it for already 10 years now, quite a long time. So the first thing I actually did is, uh, I, um, together with a, um, a friend of mine from my studies, we ported the Microsoft uh, FreeBSD over to the Microsoft Xbox One back in 2005. That was quite a cute project. Um, after that, I started working on sort of more serious projects, and, and the, the first big project I worked on was um, making the TTY layer in the FreeBSD kernel SMP safe. And after that, I moved on to a couple of other projects. Uh, for example, the VT driver that a lot of FreeBSD users use nowadays. I was the first person who started hacking on this, and sort of nice to see that it's uh, becoming popular. The year after that, I started working on Clang BSD, and Clang BSD was a branch of FreeBSD where we tried to import Clang into the base system and rip out GCC. And most of that stuff also ended up in FreeBSD. Had I'm quite happy with that, especially seeing that Clang sort of becoming really popular also outside of uh, FreeBSD. After that, I started working on C11 support because at the um, December 2011, the new uh, C spec was released and there were a lot of new interesting uh, features in that. So I added support for the C11 atomics and uh, support for some of the Unicode functions that were added. Unfortunately, um, when I graduated, I was sort of, uh, you know, uh, I started working. I ended up at a company where we didn't really work with FreeBSD a lot. So. Didn't have a lot of spare time anymore, couldn't, couldn't hack on FreeBSD as much as I liked, but late last year, um, I uh, decided to, to quit and actually start my own company. So um, what I'm going to present over here, it's, it's an open source product that you can just use in any way you like, but you know, keep in mind that my company also offers commercial support on it. So um, please get in touch if you, you think about using it. Um, I'd be very interested to hear uh, what interesting use cases you want to use it for. So before I'm going to explain what, what Cloud ABI is, I'm going to give uh, two introductions. The first one's called, What's Wrong with Unix? It, this may sound a bit overly harsh, but you know people always um, um, have different opinions about what's wrong with Unix, but it's what's, what's wrong with Unix in my opinion. After that, I'm going to give an introduction on, on Capsicum. Um, most of you have probably heard of that, and after that, I'm going to speak about Cloud ABI and Cloud Libc. So, Unix, in my opinion, is a really op um, awesome operating system. I've been using different flavors of, of Unix for quite a long time now. But what I realize over the last couple of years is that un most Unix systems, they sort of share a common set of problems. And one of the largest problems is that it's, it, doesn't make it, ac it doesn't make it easy to run software securely. And I'm going to explain over the next couple of slides what I mean with that. It also doesn't really stimulate you to write software that can be reused easily and um, can be tested easily. And there are certain sort of ongoing open source projects within the, um, or certain projects within the uh, open source community that, uh, community that have been dragging on for a decade. And in my opinion, those could be blamed to uh, reusability and testability. And finally, I think that systems administration um, on Unix is far from perfect. We spend too much time, um, you know, maintaining a Unix system and not the program on top. 
So what's wrong with Unix security? So there are two problems in my opinion. The first one is that um, if you want to run a service, the security impact of a security exploit is far too big. So say you want to run a web service um, and the only thing it needs to do is handle incoming HTTP requests, um, access a couple of data files that are stored on disk, send some RPCs to some kind of database service and, and hand, handle its response. In practice, this process can do a lot more. So if there's a security bug in this web server, an attacker can already do quite a lot of interesting things, even without being root. So first of all, it could create a tarball of the entire system and send it back over HTTP. Um, it could also register cron jobs. So even if you as a system as an administrator notice that there's a security bug in this web service and fix it, I mean, an, an attacker could have easily just installed a binary somewhere on the, um, like in slash temp or whatever, wherever and relaunch it from the cron tab. So you, know, you really have a hard time sort of figuring these things out because you know, most people don't actually look at the cron tabs of the system to see whether they're still, uh, still in a consistent state. Also, while you're trying to log in and actually trying to figure out what's going on with the system, the attacker can invoke the right command line tool and spam your TTY. Fortunately, there's a way to turn this off, but still it's annoying that th this is enabled by default. And even if an attacker decides to like, not steal any data from the system or do anything harmful, it could still turn the system into a, like a Bitcoin miner or something like that, you know, compute stuff and then send it back to the other side. So um, there are a couple of things that have been designed over time to, to mitigate this, and Capsicum is one of them, but a lot of these systems, they are not really that effective. Uh, for example, app armor and you know, um, abusing SE Linux policies to try to make software more secure. So the second problem, and this is um, like something that doesn't get enough attention in my opinion, is that it's not that easy to just run third-party applications directly on top of a Unix kernel without um, sacrificing the integrity of the system. So say you get a third-party application just from like a random customer or doesn't really matter, from some page on the internet and you just run dot slash this program, that's actually quite unsafe, especially if you just do it as your own user, right? It could just um, delete all the files in your home directory, plunder your PGP keyring, whatever. Even running it as a separate user is still not that secure. So in the meantime, we invented technologies like jails and you know, on the Linux side, C groups. Um, you know, nowadays, Docker is a heavy user of C groups, and they sort of try to, to make this more secure. But in practice, you see that it's sort of the API that's exposed by the kernel is so incredibly large that it's really hard to get something like C groups and jails work correctly. So you, you can already notice it if you're inside of a jail, you can still get quite a lot of information from the host system. Um, and it's questionable whether that information should be exposed. So most people nowadays, they, they use VMs to sort of create this security. And you can, for example, see this in like cloud computing where parties like Amazon and Google, they, they, they have an offering for virtual machines. You know, you just get your own system and you just have to install it completely, which is a shame because that doesn't really exploit the cloud to its full potential in my opinion. It would have been a lot nicer if you could just say to like Amazon or Google, here's a program, just run it for me and automatically scale it up and balance it and do whatever you like instead of just giving you individual Linux virtual machines and you sort of try to build something robust on top of that. So um, I already mentioned it a couple of slides earlier. I think that it's really hard to make reusable and testable software on Unix. And um, I've, when making these slides, I've, I discovered that it was actually really hard to explain why. You know, it's um, like someone who can't see explaining, trying to explain to that person what the color green is. It's pretty hard. So. What I decided was to sort of first take a look at another environment where testing is actually a solved problem. So there's this programming language called Java, and it allows you to build all these really nice applications. And um, you know, sometimes Java programmers are being mocked of writing insane code that you can't read anymore. But there are some things in Java that are actually quite smart, and we could learn from it. So say I would write a very simple web server in Java. Um, this is, of course, not a complete class. There are more member functions, but you know, a simple web server would, would sort of look something like this or contain code like this. Namely, we need to keep track of some kind of network socket and in some kind of string, we store the root directory of our web server. 
you know, whenever you get like a get request for slash file, you just concatenate the slash file to the root directory and you know which file to open. So a really poor web server would sort of be initialized like this, right? I mean, when the class is constructed, you just create a network socket on port 80 and you know, set a root directory to a certain directory. We all agree that this web server is not really reusable, right? I mean, if I would want to run a web server on port 81, two web servers at the, t at the same time, or you know, using a different root directory, I can't do it if I use this model. So then you sort of decide to extend the class, right? I mean, add a couple of arguments to the constructor, you know, pass in a port number in the root directory, and suddenly this web server is a lot more, a lot better to reuse. But still, in practice, you see that if you truly want to make a web server that's reusable, you implement it like this. So instead of letting the web server construct its own TCP socket on a certain port number, you pass in the socket. The advantage of this approach is this web server now works with different network protocols. It, does, it not only works with TCP, it, it could work with like a Unix socket, whatever. You could even sort of have a virtual network socket that's not really attached to a physical network socket in the operating system that you can use for testing, like a mock socket. Um, the same holds for file system access. Instead of, you know, literally opening files within the, like the web server class, you want to pass in like a directory object with a couple of member functions like, you know, get file contents. And the nice thing is you can now test this web server completely from within Java code with no interaction with the, the actual operating system. So my observation is that the way we actually write Unix applications, it's similar to the first two examples, right? I mean, they either hard code quite a lot of assumptions, and if they don't, they hard code path names to configuration files specifying the, the, the configuration of the application. So applications, they acquire resources on behalf of you instead of um, you just providing the resources to the application. You know, in one, for example, with Apache, in a configuration file, you specify an IP address and the port number you want to listen on, and Apache opens the network socket for you. And the disadvantage of this model is that every time you want the, the, the web server to do, like, uh, you want it to teach, to teach it a special trick, for example, I want you to bind on the TCP socket where you have different TCP timeout parameters. You can't do this. You, you need to add explicit support to the web server for this. You can't just provide it a network socket where everything is configured the way you like. Um, everything needs to be implemented in Apache itself. And in my opinion, that's sort of a double standard. When we're writing object-oriented software, we really uh, appreciate writing testable code, but for Unix applications, we don't care a lot about it. So here's an example of a simple Unix web server that is, in fact, testable. It's actually really easy. It sort of assumes that on file descriptor zero, there's already a networking socket present. And um, you know, whenever it gets a, an incoming request, it just replies, hello world. I mean, a proper web server would be more a bit more complex, of course. But the nice thing about this web server is that you see that I didn't add a single line of code to add IPv6 support to this web server, right? I mean, <coughs> how many years did it take uh, before we actually had proper IPv6 support in most of our Unix software, right? All of that could have been prevented if the, the network socket was just provided to the application. Um, the nice thing is, I didn't write a single line of code to actually get support for uh, concurrency, because what I can do is I can just spawn the same web server process 10 times and give it the, name, uh, the same network socket. There's no need to implement this thread pool inside of the web server anymore. And this web server is also testable, because I can just provide it a Unix socket and just programmatically inject requests and um, uh, check whether I get the desired response. So a lot less code and you get more features. That's, that's what it boils down to. So capsicum, sort of switching over to a different topic, but later on you'll see what the relationship is with what I explained previously. So who of you uh, uh, has heard of capsicum? Okay, who of you hasn't heard of capsicum before? Okay, well then, um, it's good that I have this slide. It's uh, sort of a quick introduction to how Capsicum works. Capsicum is a sandboxing technique that's present on FreeBSD and allows you to harden applications, um, make them more secure. And it's actually quite easy how it works. So your program starts up like a regular Unix process. There's no configuration file in slash EDC that describes how this program should be sandboxed. It 
It's just a regular Unix process. But at some point in time, the program calls a special system call called cap enter. And cap enter is the system call that instructs the kernel to say, from now on, I'm not, not going to open any new resources anymore. So I'm not going to open any random files on disk anymore. I'm not going to create any new network sockets. You can lock me up. I only need to interact with the file descriptors that I have. So, so system calls like read, write, accept, they still work because they operate on the file descriptors that you have. System calls like reboot, unlink, they simply don't work anymore because they depend on so-called global namespaces. Um, what's interesting is that it still al allows you to access the file system because what POSIX 2008 added was um, support for um, opening files relative to a file descriptor. They added this feature to um, make it possible to have race-free access to the file system. But this is actually also used by Capsicum. So if you have a file descriptor to a directory, you can call the open at system call and still open all the files underneath. So this is really powerful because if you compare it to change routes, for example, you lock up the application in a single directory. With this approach, you can um, just open as many directories as you like, then call cap enter and still have access to those directories. So this is um, used by quite a lot of programs nowadays on FreeBSD, DH client, ping. I mean, ping only opens a single network socket, and after that, it can just call cap enter. It has a file descriptor to the to the raw network socket used for the ICMP traffic. It has a file descriptor to your terminal, so it can still send network packets, receive them, and write um, statistics to your terminal. That's all it needs to do. Um, SSHD also uses it nowadays, at least on FreeBSD. Um, another interesting service is HASD, written by uh, PJD. Um, it's a, like a network storage service. Um, the only thing it needs to do is, it needs to have a single network socket on which it gets incoming network requests for, you know, give me this piece of data. And it needs to have one file descriptor to, um, to a um, file system partition and it can export that over the network. So HASD is a, is a quite powerful mechanism for, for sandboxing applications. So late last year, I, um, I started to use Capsicum in a piece of software that I was writing um, to you know, make it more secure. I wanted to harden, them, to harden it. And I noticed that Capsicum is really awesome. It really works as advertised. It really does what it's supposed to do. In my opinion, other operating systems should add support for Capsicum as well. I mean, it would be nice if NetBSD, OpenBSD also added support for it. And there's um, someone working for Google who's trying, uh, who has written support for Linux as well and is trying to get that upstream. That's going a bit slower than I'd want, but we're getting there. The only thing that I noticed about Capsicum was that, um, it sounds weird, but Capsicum doesn't scale. And with that, I mean, it's really easy to sandbox really simple programs. I mean. You see all these changes flash by in FreeBSD that people add capsicum or they capsicumize utilities like cat and sort and unique. Those are really easy to patch up, right? I mean, you just open the, the, the files initially, call cap enter, and it's locked up. But as soon as you have a program that becomes more complex, and with that I mean, for example, more lines of code, more third party code, it actually becomes pretty hard. And the reason for it is that. If you want to capsicumize an application, what you typically do is you, you come up with a, like a, a point in the code where you want to sort of start sandboxing. So before you actually receive any network requests, do anything that, that, that might be sensitive. You just put a cap enter call there. You start the application for the first time and it breaks miserably because it turns out that it needs to open all these random files on disk. And then you sort of iterate on it until it works. So that's not easy. You know, applications might break in really non-trivial ways, right? You might get these really obscure error messages or no error messages at all. And it really takes some time before you can actually uh, uh, port a, a large-scale application over to Capsicum. And what I've noticed that even the, the standard FreeBSD libraries, they don't work that well with Capsicum. So I can give you a couple of examples. So the top line of code, local time underscore r, what it does is it's a function that um, takes a Unix timestamp and converts it over to like seconds, hours, minutes, day of the month, that kind of stuff. So that translation depends on your time zone, of course. Um, you know, for example, if you're in the Netherlands, you first add or subtract what's uh, 3600 seconds or 7200 seconds from the timestamp before doing the conversion. 
So what I noticed is that um, if you use this function before you call cap enter, it uses touch time, in my case. If you call cap enter first, it uses UTC. Because the problem is that this function, the first time you call it, it needs to open user share zone info slash Europe slash Amsterdam, in my case, before it can actually uh, convert time properly. So um, you need to make sure that you at least convert a timestamp once before calling cap enter before you actually use the proper time zone. Um, that's, that's not easy. Well, if you know it, it's easy to keep in mind, but you know, in a larger application, that it, this is really annoying, of course. So another thing that I notice is like the following. Uh, character set support. So POSIX 2008 added support for creating uh, so-called uh, locale handles through a function called new locale. And what you say is, you know, I want to have a, like a handle to the Chinese locale. And what you can then do, or the Chinese locale that uses UTF-8. And then you can pass this locale on to, to functions like WCS to MBS. And I'll explain what the name means. It literally means white character string to multi-byte string. You pass in a Unicode string, which means four bytes per character on one Unicode code point, and it actually generates a UTF-8 string or any other character uh, set for what it's worth. If you call cap enter, this functionality breaks completely. You can't create new locale handles anymore because every time you call this function, it needs to open user share locale slash whatever. And the piece of code at the bottom was actually the, the worst example that I encountered. It was a, um, I, I, I won't, give you the name of this library, but, but, it, but it was a really horrible crypto library, not OpenSSL. <laughs> what happened is, it contains this piece of code. The, the first time you start to use random data, what it tries to do, it tries to open dev your random, and if that fails, it falls back to this piece of code. So if I would call cap enter over here, I would have some pretty decent entropy, right? I would open dev view random. If I put cap, ran, uh, cap enter over here, my entropy is not that good anymore. And this is impossible to figure out, right? I mean, I, I only discovered this by luck because I was um, running trust over my application, so getting a syscall dump, and I saw open dev view random uh, return minus one, e not capable, and underneath I saw get time of day, get pit, and the problem's like, oh no, this can't be real. Looked at the library source code, and indeed, this was in it. Just Horrible. So is there a way that we can structurally solve it, this problem? And I thought about this quite hard, and I don't think it's that easy, because we sort of have conflicting requirements between environments, right? So normally in FreeBSD, we don't want to put all sorts of data in libc that might change. So for example, time zone information changes quite a lot. So you don't want to hard code it into the applications. You just want to put it in a separate directory. If you want to build this cluster slash cloud computing environment where you want applications to be sort of more self-sustained and don't really depend on the environment, you might want to compile it into the binary. <coughs> also, functions like open, you know, functions that simply don't work with Capsicum at all, just reboot whatever, you want them to be present because you want to write software against them. But after you call cap enter, it would have been a lot nicer if you actually got compiler errors for that piece of code. So all the code that runs after cap, cap enter, is if it calls open, then you want to throw a compiler error. So what I thought about was instead of writing some kind of really complex linting tool or something that, 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 could, that you could run over code and you know, might give you an indication of what kind of work needs to be done before it works, and you know, it, it wouldn't work well, it would give like thousands of false positives, et cetera. I, I, just, I started to think about what would it be like if you set, sort of had a pure capability-based runtime environment. So what do I mean with that? I mean that if the program starts up, it's already in the sandbox environment. So it's not as if you need to call cap enter anymore. Cap enter is already called, called right before main runs. Or even before that, like before the first instruction of the program runs, cap enter is already called by the kernel. So what you could do is you could just remove all capsicum unsafe functions entirely. So all administrative interfaces, everything that depends on global namespaces, just throw it out entirely. That would mean that existing code would fail to build. A lot of existing code would fail to build. But the nice thing is that you then exactly know what you need to fix, right? 
I mean, that piece of code that I showed earlier, like open dev view random else fall back to other functions, that code would fail to build because it calls open. What you could also do is sort of go all in and decide, you know, all the functions that are part of this runtime environment that deal with locales, time zones, protocol databases, services databases, just build them into the C library instead of depending on any global state. So after giving it a lot of thought, I realized that this is actually not a, not a really bad idea. Because what it means, it means that um, it's suddenly safe to just execute arbitrary third-party code, right? I mean, uh, as long as you don't give it file descriptors to uh, things that you don't want to give it access to, you can just run programs directly on top of a Unix kernel without needing any virtualization or sandboxing. So you could just um, start your own cloud provider and say um, to your customers, instead of um, um, giving them virtual machines, you can just say, I'm going to start this application and I'll make sure that there's on file descriptor zero a network socket, on file descriptor one there's a log file, file descriptor two is a connection to a database backend. And this program can't access any other part of the system. Um, you know, you don't, you don't need to do any traditional Linux systems administration anymore that way. Uh, that would be a really interesting approach in my opinion. Also, it would mean that software is reusable and testable by default, right? I mean, you just start it up with a different set of file descriptors and you can let it talk to different database backends, you can inject um, uh, requests and, and capture responses, you can let it use a different directory on disk, all that kind of stuff. You can also much more easily migrate software around because what you can do is um, the application cannot hard code a single path name. You really provide all the directories up front. So if you just move data around and just say, the next time I'm starting this application, I just, you know, give it a, I, I update the, the, I just make sure that I give it a file descriptor to this new directory, and it's a lot easier to migrate. So migrating processes between servers might be a lot easier with this model. And one of the things I also thought about is. If you look at a larger scale, so if you have a, like a larger setup, a couple of database nodes, some kind of MapReduce running right next to it, a lot of batch jobs, web front ends, like a, a whole set of different applications run or like tools running in like a web stack or just a, a service. The nice thing is that all the dependencies between all those tasks that form this service, they are known up front, right? So, what you can do is you can do some really um, interesting tricks when it comes to um, you know, cluster management. You could have some kind of cluster suite that automatically knows, like, if the database backends are down, there's no need for me to actually start up the front ends because they, I can't give them a network connection to the database backends anyway. What you could, for example, do is um, the cluster management realizes that all of the database backends are running in a completely different data center as the front ends. You know, it just looks at the dependencies, the entire dependency graph of all the services that it's running, and it observes that there are some, that the locality is not perfect. So it can actually sort of start to reshuffle processes across data centers to actually improve locality. That's stuff that's almost impossible to do right now with traditional Linux VMs, right? I mean, they're just autonomous systems completely on their own and the cluster management system doesn't know anything about it at all. So that's why, I, um, like, when I realized those kinds of things, that's when I started working on Cloud ABI. And Cloud ABI is a sort of really low-level building block. There is no high-level cluster management yet, but you, know, you need to start somewhere. It's basically this pure capability-based runtime environment that I've been talking about. So you could think of it as POSIX minus Cap oh, sorry, POSIX plus Capsicum minus stuff that doesn't work with, with Capsicum anyway. And what I realize is as soon as you start doing this, Unix becomes incredibly small. There are so many things on FreeBSD that, are, that don't make any sense anymore if you use Capsicum. If you just remove them, what's left is actually really small. Um, I ended up with just 57 system calls that um, um, implement most of the POSIX 2008 features. If you compare it to FreeBSD, FreeBSD has something like 400, 500 system calls by now. So it's just one-tenth the size of, of FreeBSD, one-seventh the size of Linux. It's, it becomes really small. So what I started doing is I started uh, coming up with this um, you know, specification of what a safe Unix runtime environment looked like. And instead of just using the doing the traditional approach of 
writing a kernel, writing libc, I decided to first sort of standardize the, the, the binary interface. So, for example, here, this is a file that just contains all the system calls, just a list of all the system calls and their arguments. And you can reuse this in any way you like. So if you're writing your own kernel and you think, I want to support cloud ABI processes, you can just use this file and derive your own system call table from this. Alternatively, you can also automatically create language bindings with this definition. So if you're writing your own libc or something like that, you could just you know, use this list and generate a, a system call wrapper. If you don't want to run C programs but want to create a Go, Rust, Ruby, Java runtime, instead of building it on top of a C library, you could also consider like, I'm just going to write uh, software directly against, um, um, against the kernel. And that might be easier for, for some uh, runtime environments because, for example, the threading environment that, that Go has looks nothing like pthreads what we have. And I mean, Go would have been a lot simpler if they could actually had an API like this where they could do low level programming against the kernel. So the constants, types, and data structures are completely defined separately. They're not part of an operating system or part of an implementation. And the idea is that we're not going to write our very own operating system because, I mean, the world's not waiting for yet another operating system. But we can just add support to existing operating systems for cloud ABI, similar to how Compat Linux works on FreeBSD. You know, FreeBSD can run Linux binaries as well, or at least a subset of Linux binaries. We can just do the same trick and add a compact free BSD to all of the operating systems. And this compact free BSD is going to be quite compact, actually, because, um, I mean, compact Linux is, you know, it needs to emulate hundreds of system calls, but in this case, we only need to, to implement 57 of them. What this means is that you then end up with an environment where you can just compile programs once and run them on multiple operating systems. And this is exactly what you want for, like, a cluster cloud computing environment, right? I mean, it would be really annoying if, a large cluster provider like Amazon would say, like, we're, we offer cloud ABI support, but you do need to make sure that you use the Linux cloud ABI or the FreeBSD cloud ABI. There just needs to be a cloud ABI. So what does this low-level API look like? It actually looks quite a lot like the traditional POSIX API, except that there are some, um, some system calls that are missing or a bit weirder than they usually are, and they also don't depend on any global state. So what I wrote is a couple of um, um, header files. And for every system call, the system call table, that table, they generate a static inline function that uses inline assembly. <coughs> so you can just copy that, that file directly in your, into your source tree and invoke the system calls. And these functions don't depend on any global state. So they don't keep track of the error number in, in, in a global um, variable. You know, they're really just on their own. If you actually take a look at the disassembly that they generate, it's just a couple of instructions and they they give you the return value directly. So here are a couple of sort of more traditional Unix system calls. So at the top there is mmap trying to allocate some memory. You know, using map anon, it just gives you back some anonymous, anonymous memory. Below that is a write call. So there is no traditional write call in the sense that you can just provide a buffer and a length. No, it uses IO vectors by default. So I first did an IO vector where I explained, I want to send this buffer that's six characters long you know, I, I create a single I.O. vector for that, and then I say, write out this single I.O. vector that's used for scatter vector, uh, sorry, scatter gather writing. Of course, a traditional exit system call, but on the next slide, I have a couple of system calls that are a bit less traditional. So an example is, you know, raising signals. Normally, if your application is doing something wrong, you want to terminate it. Traditionally, you would just write kill, get bid, whatever. Kill, get bid, sig abort. There's a libc function called raise, and it does exactly that. It does kill, get bid, signal. Because we don't want processes to act, um, access the global process table, you know, uh, instead of providing a true syst a kill system, uh, a kill system call, I added a raise system call, which makes a lot more sense. So there's also, for example, a separate system call for acquiring random data because you can't open dev view random anymore. And this is actually also an interesting system call. I I mean, it looks quite traditional, MK there. But there are things, there are two things to it that are um, sort of out of the ordinary. So my guess is that most people will be writing C programs against this, right? Um, but I want to sort of make it future proof. C is only one of the few programming languages out there that uses null terminated strings. Um, most other programming languages they use, they just keep track of an explicit count. So 
all of the system calls that take path names, they actually ex expect an explicit length to be passed in. So this makes it a lot cleaner if you just want to write, say, a Go runtime on top of this. Because instead of copying the path name over into a buffer that's one byte longer and adding an explicit null byte, you can now just say, like, here's just this piece of memory, and I, I'm going to create this directory. It's really nice, because you can also sort of cut path names. So if you have a really long path name consisting of multiple components, you can say, OK, mkdir first the five, like the first five bytes, then mkdir on the first 20 bytes, 50 bytes, whatever, depending on all the components of your path name. And also something that's uh, different compared to traditional, uh, traditional Unix is normally this system call would have one additional parameter, namely permission bits. In the environment that I'm writing, user credentials are not that important anymore. Your user ID is something that, that doesn't make any sense on this cloud computing platform, right? You just want to run in your own isolated environment. So permission bits are simply non-existent. If you call this function on, on one of the existing M implementations, it will just use 0777 or something like that, but then with the U mask applied. So of course, people shouldn't use this API if they just want to write their own, their sort of more traditional applications. That's an API that's only interesting for uh, people working on their own runtime environments. But most people would want to use CloudLibc. And CloudLibc is a C library that you can just fetch from GitHub that I wrote. And it's a C library that only implements the parts of POSIX that make sense. So the goal is not to achieve 100% POSIX compliancy, but 90% POSIX compliancy, so to speak. All of the stuff that doesn't work is simply not there. So this raises compiler errors, and this makes it a lot easier to actually capsicumize existing programs. Um, using the C library doesn't actually cause a lot of vendor lock-in, because there are also not that many extensions. It's really just Unix plus capsicum minus incompatible features. So if you write software against this, you can still use it on Linux and BSD. There, aren't, there, aren't, there simply aren't that many extensions. So the nice thing is that um, CloudLibc has a lot of unit tests, uh, 650 of them right now. And these unit tests are used for two different things. First of all, they make sure that the library itself works correctly. But they can actually also be used to check whether the implementation, the operating system you're running to, is, um, implements all the necessary features. And I can show you what these unit tests look like. So I started looking around for C unit testing frameworks all over the, the internet. And I looked at, uh, what was again, check and C unit and what have you. But I actually like none of them. I mean, they were overly verbose. Um, uh, they were just a pain to use. So for example, I think it was C unit or check where you, in addition to writing the test, you had to write your own main function where you sum up all the unit tests. And in my case, where I have 650 unit tests, you don't want to have this one main function where you manually register all the tests, right? It just needs to be done automatically. So is there anyone who recognizes this syntax? Has anyone ever used a, yes, what is it? It looks a lot like Google tests, exactly. So this is just, this is um, um, a testing framework that I wrote myself, and I, I can explain you why. But it uses the same syntax as Google Test. I mean, I really like Google Test. It's a really nice testing framework for C++. And this is Google Test for C, essentially. So it doesn't use any C. Exactly. But there were two reasons why I came up with my un uh, unit testing suite. So first of all, when I started to write tests, there was no, I couldn't run any single C++ code yet, of course. But the most important thing is this unit testing framework has a couple of other sort of aces up its sleeve. So for example, every test get it gets its own file descriptor to a temp directory that it can use to store files in, in its tests. I mean, that's something that you, it's not, of course not that important with Google Test, right? You can just access all these global namespaces. But with this, I want to write tests for creating Unix sockets and writing stuff through it. I want to test all the file system, system calls. So that's why I needed to extend it to actually provide support for access, accessing file systems. So yes, um, that Google Test is a really awesome C, uh, C++ unit testing framework. And I mean, do use it. It's so much better than all the other stuff out there. Um, yes, next slide. So yes, I did write, oh. What's that? Did your testing framework depend on Cloud API or can you use it outside as well? 
Well, you can use it outside of Cloud ABI. Right now it's integrated into Cloud LibC, but it could just be uh, pulled out and used elsewhere. Um, I, uh, yes, I think it's completely independent of Cloud LibC, actually. If you just copen, uh, copy over the source files, it would work. Maybe you need to adjust some of like the uh, first couple of uh, lines from the, the header file, you know, to include the right dependencies, but it would be right, uh, quite easy to use. Another advantage of this is that uh, what I really like about um, Google Tests is that it automatically derives the typing. So if you say assert equals on two floating point numbers and it fills it actually prints it as floating point numbers, which is an integer, it prints it uh, as if it's an integer. Um, you can also achieve this in C nowadays by using C11 generic. So this uses C11 generic quite, quite a lot to just make it um, sort of type oblivious in a certain way. Um, so yes, there are quite a lot of components that I'm reusing uh, uh, from some of the other systems out there. So for example, malloc. Writing your own malloc is not a fun thing to do, and it also doesn't make sense because there are implementations out there that are so much better than I, I could possibly write. So I decided to go for JE malloc. It's a malloc that's also part of, um, of FreeBSD. Also, math and complex math support. <laughs> that's just hard to get right. So I decided to use FreeBSD's, uh, sorry, OpenLibM. OpenLibM is a project that you can also just find on GitHub, and it's a mixture of all the BSD libms out there. Um, it's pretty good, it's portable, it doesn't use a lot of BSD-isms, and I could easily integrate it into uh, Cloud libc. And also for uh, parsing and printing floating point numbers, that's also quite a tricky job. So instead of writing my own algorithm, or uh, I decided to go for um, a package called double conversion, you can also find it on GitHub, and it's written by a guy called Florian Leutsch. It uses an algorithm called Grisu. You can also find a really nice paper about it on the internet if you just search for Florian Leutsch Grisu. The top hits a paper on that. And this algorithm was written by Google because what they discovered was that when printing and parsing floating point numbers in uh, Chrome, V8, Dart, they noticed that um, the implementations differ wildly between operating systems. So on certain operating systems, they, they work really quickly, but they are inaccurate. On other operating systems, they run very slowly, but they have good precision. So Grisu is an algorithm that is supposedly faster than the traditional GD2A algorithm that we use on, um, on FreeBSD, but it's also supposed to be correct in a certain way. There are quite a lot of correctness properties that he has proven over it. So I really like that library, it's good. So data sets, you know, um, for example, time zone information. <coughs> I am using the official IANA time, Z, uh, time zone database, of course, because coming up with your own time zone information is a hell of a lot of work, and the IANA time zone data is pretty good. The only thing I didn't use is the um, uh, time zone code package, and the reason for it is that, um, so the TZ code is a package that contains an implementation of, for example, local time and NK time. But what it wants to do is it wants to really open files in user share uh, zone info and wants to parse them. It, it wants to parse these binary files. And what I did with my implementation is that I, I can show it to you, it's quite funny actually. I wrote a really ugly Python script. I'm not going to p uh, show the Python script to you. But um, this Python script just converts the, the time zone data into this huge structure, uh, structure initializer. So, uh, this entire file is 6,000 lines long. <laughs> um, the in the repo. Yes, the script is in the repo, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, uh, it took me quite some time to get the script to work correctly because there were, you know, um, uh, quite a lot of annoying things in the file, in, in the time zone data files. They use a couple of constructs only in a couple of places and they're really annoying to parse, <coughs> etc. But the nice thing about this approach is normally uh, time zone data sort of expanded. So the official time zone data files say it's sort of like a macro language. They sort of say before 1991, the Netherlands had its own rules, but after 1991, CEU. And then it has a list of rules that apply to the EU. So normally all those rules are expanded. So user share zone info is typically quite a large directory on, on Unix systems. One file per time zone, it has all the rules expanded. These aren't expanded. 
And the fun thing is I managed to augment the data structure in a couple of places, adding like a couple of key numbers that were missing, but I, I'm recomputing it. And it still allows you to apply a linear time algorithm on it to convert the, 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 the time zones. So what's also really funny I can show uh, to you guys, I mean, I still have 15 minutes. There's a tool called Zdump, and what it does, you can just run it on your existing system, and it prints two lines for every time the, 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 the time became discontinuous. So, for example, if I take a look at 2015, you can see that at um, one sec uh, at, at one o'clock at midnight UTC time, the time jumped from two o'clock to three o'clock in the Netherlands. So what I did is I wrote an, uh, a, a funny Python script that actually parses this output again from Zdump. Um, time, local time, L, test. And it then creates test vectors for it. So, <laughs> I mean, by using the, uh, I just used the, the output of the Zdump tool to create unit tests for my own implementation again. So the implementation works really, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's quite correct. Um, so what stuff works, what stuff doesn't work? Quite a lot of head of files work. I'm not going to explain all those things in detail, of course, but multi-threading works. Um, that's like one of the most important things, right? Um, Unicode support is also quite decent. There's still some minor stuff that needs to be done to get, uh, for example, string collation working, um, you know, comparing strings in a like culture-specific way. Um, wide character support, it still just needs some fixes up here and there, but most of the stuff that's in POSIX actually works. Then there are a couple of things that I don't have working yet. So asynchronous I.O. isn't there yet. Uh, regexing support, I still need to find a decent regexing implementation that I can implement. Uh, Apple has a pretty good one. I'm thinking about importing that one into the C library. And then there's stuff that I'm really not going to integrate, integrate into the system. So support for reading the password database. It doesn't make sense in a cloud computing environment. So which systems do I, uh, do I support? Right now I only support x86-64 as a hardware platform. Um, my idea is to only add support for platforms that are actually being used. So it's unlikely that I'm going to add support for Spark 64 or Itanium or those kinds of systems. <laughs> but if, if people are interested in seeing ARM support appear, especially ARM v6 and higher, then of course I want to add it. So operating system support, it's like an SLA. FreeBSD, uh, free nines, 99.9% .9 of the, the tests currently pass. I'm, I'm kidding, it's actually 100%. Um, NetBSD, there's still a handful of tests that don't work. Um, still trying to figure out what I need to do to get them all to work. Linux support, I only started working on it two weeks ago, I think, so only 90% of the tests pass. But the last 10% is the hardest. And other systems, 0%, of course. How to use Cloud ABI shouldn't be that hard right now. So what you do is you just go to um, the LLVM site, try to figure out uh, the subversion path for Clang, check it out and install it. No extra patches needed. The same holds for Binutils. Just check out the latest Binutils sources, dot slash configure, dash dash target is um, x86-64 Cloud ABI, make install clean, and you already have a properly functioning cross-compiler toolchain. No patches needed at all. Well, after that, you can just install Cloud Libc, and after that, you want to, you probably want to install a couple more libraries like a compiler runtime, uh, Libc++, that kind of stuff. After that, you need to patch up your operating system kernel to support Cloud ABI executables, and after that, you're done. You can just compile software and run it directly on top of FreeBSD, Linux, or NetBSD. There is no step five. So, future work. Oh, I see a hand over there in the back. Exactly. Ex exactly. So uh, the people from Xenuos, uh, Xenuos sitting in the back, I see, or, oh, yeah, they were um, uh, kind enough to actually allocate. Oh, so I'll repeat the question. So the question was, how does the kernel know whether it's a Cloud ABI executable that needs to be executed in a different way? The answer is, I contacted the Xenuos people, and they were kind enough to actually allocate an operating system number for me. So this cross-compiler tool chain, based on Clang and Beutils, if you compile software with it and take a look at the first couple of bytes of the executable somewhere, you see the number 17 in there, and that's an indicator that it's a Cloud ABI executable. 
Um, are there any other questions? Sure. Yes, it does. So, so you can just open a directory and you obtain a file descriptor to it with open, uh, you can pass an O underscore directory, I think, and then you get a file descriptor. And you can pass that along. You can even pass it through Unix sockets to different processes on the system. And then this other process can just call open at on it to open a file underneath. Exactly, yes. So the entire subtree rooted at that file descriptor. Um, so I, um, I have uh, a couple, I think two more slides, and I'll quickly finish that off, and then we can take some other questions. So my idea for um, what I want to work on in the nearby future is first upstream FreeBSD NetBSD support. Um, my plan is to find someone at the conference who wants to uh, do code reviews, and then I can get it uh, pushed in. What I still need to do is, uh, so all of the LVM components that I'm using have been patched up to support LVM. Uh, to, to support Cloud ABI. All of those patches have been upstreamed except a couple of patches for libc++. So libc++ still doesn't build out of the box correctly. There are some fixes that I need to do to say um, IO streams and that kind of uh, stuff. But I also want to get those upstreamed, of course. I think that's really important because C++ support should just work out of the box. After that's done, I want to focus on Linux support and um, uh, after that, I want to work on a couple of other projects. I don't know about the order yet. So it would be really nice if we had FreeBSD packages for the tool chain, so you could just run make install clean and you have a nice development environment for Cloud ABI. And what I want to work on in the very far future is um, having a package manager specifically for Cloud ABI. So you can install the same package manager on FreeBSD, NetBSD, Linux, macOS. And you could say, give me um, libvorbis, libevent, just uh, mainly focusing on libraries, just give me this library for, this, uh, for Cloud ABI. And then you can just really build some high-level applications using a lot of third-party libraries. And all of those libraries are uh, Capsicum safe or Cloud ABI safe. And in the very far future, um, this is where it gets really uncertain, I would want to develop a cluster management orchestration system built on top of this model. So you take FreeBSD systems or Linux systems, you run a separate process on them, and the only thing it does is accept incoming RPCs and what you can do is you can send an RPC saying, please start up this executable and provide it these resources. And if that system then goes down, then the cluster management or the master note notices it and reschedules the processes on different systems. And this could be used, for example, by uh, you know, a larger company or cloud provider to just run user-provided software. So more information, just go to GitHub. Uh, Nuxi is the name of the company. It's based in the Netherlands, so Nuxi and L. If you um, want to, if you have any other questions, you can, you know, ask them uh, in a minute, or you can talk to me here at the conference, or alternatively, send emails. I mean, especially if you're thinking about using a product like this in a, in, in a commercial product, then I'd love to to hear how how we can help out. That's it. Are there any questions? Yes, so unfortunately, I compile them in. <laughs> They're part of the C library. That's, um, it does blow up the binary size quite a bit, but um, how I make sure that it's not, it doesn't become really bad is, so normally on most Unix systems, there's sort of this cross product between character sets and countries, right? So. There's a Dutch locale for UTF-8. There's one for ISO 80, uh, 88591. What I'm doing right now is I'm just implementing it all once. So all of the strings, locale-dependent strings, are stored in Unicode internally, and they get converted on the fly. So um, binary size um, should, I mean, it's still bigger than loading it from disk, but it shouldn't be that bad. Yeah, 
exactly, like uh, locale as a service. That's, that's, that's the idea, that you sort of have a separate process that contains all the data, and all of the processes on the system can just reuse that. Um, I think that's a good idea as long as uh, people still have the liberty of running that service themselves. Because say you would provide it as a cloud provider, um, it's a good idea, but it, um, this allows people from making modifications to the locales. Furthermore, it means that if they migrate their software to a different cloud provider that has diff a different data set that behaves differently. So that's why for now I'm, I'm still putting it in all of the executables, but there we, we can change it in the future, yeah. I saw another hand, some, yeah? Uh, you mentioned that one of the, one of the drivers for this work was uh, kind of frustration with the kind of people and support in like one application. Yeah. So have you tried to port any of your own you know, databases? Or yeah, <laughs> so, so I, I, I do have to disappoint you. I haven't really tried running applications that are extremely large for the reason that, I mean, I only started working on this I think half a year ago, and you know, already getting it working was already uh, consuming quite a lot of time. So I've, I've been experimenting with libraries instead, instead of just compiling complete programs. So for example, libevent and some uh, video and audio transcoding libraries, and I noticed that this actually works in that specific case. You, know, you compile it and you exactly know what needs to be patched up, um, but unfortunately I haven't tried running larger applications. Too bad. Because it will be like ultimate test. Yes, it would be the ultimate uh, ultimate test. And also, if, if you would get a certain like interesting piece of software working, like Nginx or MySQL, then that would suddenly mean that people could actually start using this for doing like business stuff. You know, just using it day, day to day. Right now, it's um, it is really nice to use it sort of a new software that you're developing, but. I'm, I haven't tried existing software that much, I have to confess. Um, yes? How do you start building documents as sources for them for the cloud API? That, that's also, that's a really good question. So, um, if you want to do it really primitively, for example, in a shell, you could always just use like a smaller than four space, some kind of name for a directory, and then that directory will be sort of hooked up to file descriptor number four. So you can come up with this insanely long shell commands where you say like pass in this directory, pass in this file. Is, is there a way to look at an application binary and to see what it expects to have, like a directory descriptor and a source of them? That, that's, that's also a, a, an, another really good question. So um, eventually what I want to do is um, come up with some kind of, um, how should I quickly explain this? So applications, they of course, want to have a configuration file, like a web server wants to have a config file saying, I have these virtual hosts. It would be nice if there was some kind of configuration language that sort of used namespaces, where you had a single configuration file like you normally have, like this is a web server listening on these IP addresses, um, uh, and it has this virtual host and it's rooted at this directory. But then some preprocessor runs over that configuration file and it sees all those IP addresses and path names and then replaces it by file descriptor numbers. And then that configuration is passed on to an application and it can just parse that instead and it knows which file descriptors to, uh, to use. That's something that, that would be interesting to work on, but I haven't had time to work on that yet. Does that answer your question? Uh, I think so. Okay, good. Any other questions? Yes? What's your uh, RPC API look like? What's that? So, so you can use pipes, Unix sockets, shared memory, all that kind of stuff. But, um, so there is no uniform RPC framework yet in this, so that's a bit annoying. But there's one thing that is actually pretty awesome. So this implementation does support shared locking. So two processes that open a piece of shared memory and they place a mutex or a condition variable in a piece of shared memory. So you can do some really fast user space I.O. with this. It's not. I don't have any nice abstractions on top of it, but you can write it right now. It works out of the box. Any other questions? Well, then uh, I guess that's it. Uh, thank you all for attending uh, at this time of day. <laughs> <laughs>